Uh, oh, wait a minute. That's what we are going to read today. I'm going to read it. Um, it doesn't have a date in the front here. Like a copyright or anything. I think, I think it's probably um, okay to uh, read it to you guys. I'll read the entire book here before I go to work. So um, It's kind of long and kind of boring, so get ready. Um, <laughs> see. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's a lot of stories and poems. Um, Kipling, you know, he was a was a writer, English in uh, India. His health wasn't so good. But, uh, there's one poem I like. I think it's the first one here. I'll just read that, and then uh, I think I want to read you a story about a, an elephant. Which I kind of like. Um, this is a poem, and he's talking about writing about India for people back home in England to read. I've eaten your bread and salt. I've drunk your water and wine. The deaths you died, I have watched beside. The lives that you led were mine. Was there aught that I did not share in vigil or toil or ease? One joy or woe that I did not know? your hearts across the seas. I've written the tale of our life for a sheltered people's mirth in jesting guise, but ye are wise and you know what the jest is worth. <laughs> so anyways, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the man who would be king is in here. I don't, I don't know if there's any of the Jungle Book, Jungle Books in here. This is, um, let me see here. The Works of Yudjard Kipling, one volume edition. Are there any of the Jungle Books in here? I really like those. Verses, ballads. Uh, Phantom Rich on the Ghost Stories. Axel Brown, Plant Tales from the Hills. This uh a germ destroyer. What's a germ destroyer? No, I don't, I really don't think I don't think any of the jungle books are here. So a, those are our favorites, I think. Uh, uh, well, okay, and. Uh, so it's not going to complete works of Kipling. It was pretty prolific, eh? So, okay. Yeah, this one is called uh, Motiguj Mutineer. It's the last story in this book. Uh, it goes from page 622 to uh, the end of the book here, which is on page um, 625. 626 probably. Let's put together here. 627. 622 to 627. Five pages. There we go. Motiguj Mutineer. I'm going to use this light. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a coffee planter in India who wished to clear some forest land for coffee planting. When he'd cut down all the trees and burned the underwood, the stump still remained. Dynamite is expensive and slow fire, slow. The happy medium for stump clearing is the lord of all beasts, who is the elephant. Uh, he will either push the stump out of the ground with his tusks, if he has any, or drag it out with ropes. 
The planter, therefore, hired elephants by ones and twos and threes and fell to work. The very best of all the elephants belonged to the very worst of all the drivers or mahouts. And this superior beast's name was Multiguj. It was the absolute property of his mahout, which would never have been a case under native rule, for Multiguj was a creature to be desired by kings. And his name, being translated, meant the Pearl Elephant. Because the British government was in the land, Giza, the Mahout, enjoyed his property undisturbed. He was dissipated. When he had made much money through the strength of his elephant, he would get extremely drunk and give Motiguj a beating with a tent peg over the tender nails of the forefeet. Motiguj never trampled the life out of Giza on these occasions, for he knew... After the beating was over, Disa would embrace his trunk and weep and call him love in his life and the liver of his soul and give him some liquor. Motiguj was very fond of liquor. Arak for choice, though Arak for choice, though he would drink palm tree toddy if nothing better offered. Then Disa would go to sleep between Motiguj's forefeet, and as Disa generally clo chose the middle of the public road, and as Motiguj mounted guard over him and would not permit horse, foot, or cart to pass by, traffic was congested till Disa saw fit to wake up. There was no sleeping in the daytime on the planter's clearing. The wages were too high to risk. Disa sat on Motiguj's neck and gave him orders while Motiguj rooted up the stumps, for he owned a magnificent pair of trunks, tusks, or pulled at the end of a rope, for he had a magnificent pair of shoulders. While these I kicked him behind the ears and said he was the king of elephants. At evening time, Motiguj would wash down his 300 pound weight of green food with a quart of a arak, and these I would take a share and sing songs between Motiguj's legs till it was time to go to bed. Once a week, Disa led Motiguj down to the river, and Motiguj lay on his side luxuriously in the shallows while Disa went over him with a choir swab and a brick. Motiguj never mistake, mistook the pounding blow of the latter for the smack of the former that warmed him to get up and turn over on the other side. Then Disa would look at his feet and examine his eyes and turn up the fringes of his mighty ears in case of sores or budding ophthalmia. After inspection, the two would come up with a song from the sea, Motiguj, all black and shining, waving a torn tree branch twelve feet long in his trunk, and Disa knotting up his own long wet hair. It was a peaceful, well-paid life till Disa felt the return of desire to drink deep. He wished for an orgy. The little drafts that led nowhere were taking the manhood out of him. He went to the planter and said, My mother's dead, said he, weeping. She died on the plantation two months ago, and she died once before then, when you were working for me last year, said the planter, who knew something of the ways of nativedom. Then it's my aunt, and she was just the same as her mother to me, said Disa, weeping more than ever. She has left 18 small children entirely without bread, and it is I who must fill their little stomachs, said Disa, beating his head on the floor. Who brought the news, said the planter. The post, said Disa. There hasn't been a post here for the past week. Get back to your lines. A devastating illness has fallen on my village, and all my wives are dying, yelled Disa, really in tears this time. Call Chihun, who comes from Disa's village, said the planter. Chihun, has this man got a wife? He? No, not a woman of our village would look at him. They'd sooner marry the elephant. Chihun snorted. Disa wept and bellowed. You will get into a difficulty in a minute, said the planter. Go back to your work. Now I will speak heaven's truth, gulped Disa with an inspiration. I haven't been drunk for two months. I desire to depart in order to get properly drunk afar off and distant from this heavenly plantation. Thus I shall cause no trouble. 
a flickering smile across Blonde's face. Deesa, said he, you've spoken the truth, and I give you leave on the spot if anything could be done with Moti Guj while you're away. You know that he will only obey your orders. May the light of the heavens live forty thousand years. I shall be absent but ten little days. After that, upon my faith and honor and soul, I return. As to the con inconsiderable interval, have I the gracious permission of the heaven-born to call up Moti Guj? Permission was granted, and in answer to Deesa's shrill yell, mighty Tusker swung out of the shade of a clump of trees where he had been squirting dust over himself till his master should return. Light of my heart, protector of the drunken mountain of might. Give ear, said Deesa, standing in front of him. Moti Guj gave ear and saluted with his trunk. I am going away, said Deesa. Motiguj's eyes twinkled. He liked Chance as well as his master. One could snatch all manner of nice things from the roadside then. But you fussy old pig must stay behind and work. The twinkle died out as Motiguj tried to look delighted. He hated stump holing on the plantation. It hurt his teeth. I should be gone for ten days, oh, delectable one. Hold up your near forefoot, and I'll impress the fact upon it, warty toad of a dried mud puddle. Deesa took a tent peg and banged Moti Guj ten times on the nails. Moti Guj grunted and shuffled from foot to foot. Ten days, said Deesa, you will work and haul and root up the trees as Chihun Hiller shall order you. Take up Chihun and set him on your neck. Moti Guj curled the tip of his trunk. Chihun put his neck his foot there, and was swung onto the neck. Deesa handed Chihun the heavy onks, the iron elephant gourd. Chihun thumped Motiguj's bald head as a paver thumps a curbstone. Motiguj trumpeted. Be still, hog of the backwoods, Chihun's mouth. Chihun's your mahout for ten days, and now bid me goodbye, beast, after mine own heart. Oh, my lord, my king, jewel of all created elephants, lily of the herd, preserve your honored health and be virtuous. Adieu. Moti Guj lapped his trunk round Disa and swung him in the air twice. This was his way of bidding him goodbye. It'll work now, said Disa to the planter. Have I leave to go? The planter nodded and Disa dived into the woods. Moti Guj went back to hall stumps. Chihun was very kind to him, but he felt unhappy and forlorn for all that. Chihun gave him a ball of spices and tickled him under the chin, and Chihun's little baby cooed to him after work was over, and Chihun's wife called him a darling, but Moti Guj was a bachelor by instinct, as Disa was. He did not understand the domestic emotions. He wanted the light of his universe back on. The drink and the drunken slumber, the savage beatings and the savage caresses. Nonetheless, he worked well, and the planter wondered. Gisa had wandered along the road till so he met a marriage procession of his own caste, and drinking, dancing, and tippling, he had drifted with it past all knowledge of the lapse of time. The morning of the eleventh day dawned, and there returned no Gisa. Moti Guj was loosed from his ropes for the daily stint. He swung clear, looked round, shrugged his shoulders, and began to walk away as one having business elsewhere. Hey, oh, come back, you, shouted Chihun. Come back and put me on your neck, Miss Bone Mountain. Return, splendor of the hillsides, adornment of all India, heave to or I'll bang you every toe off your forefoot. Moti Guj gurgled gently, but did not obey. Chihun ran after him with a rope and caught him up. Moti Guj put his ears forward, and Chihun knew what that meant, though he tried to carry it off with high words. None of your nonsense with me, said he. To the pickets, devil, son. Rumpf, said Moti Guj, and that was all. That and the potent ears. Moti Guj put his hands in his pockets, chewed a branch for a toothpick, and strolled about the clearing, making fun of all the other elephants who had just set to work. 
Chihun reported the state of affairs to the planter, who came out with a dog whip and cracked it furiously. Mutiguj paid the white man the compliment of charging him nearly a quarter of a mile across the clearing and harumphing him into his veranda. Then he stood outside the house, chuckling to himself and shaking all over with the fun of it as an elephant will. We'll thrash him, said the planter. He shall have the finest thrashing ever received by an elephant. Give Kalanag and Nazim twelve foot of chain apiece and tell them to lay on twenty. Kalanag, which means black snake, and Nazim were two of the biggest elephants in the lines, and one of their duties was to administer the graver punishment, since no man can beat an elephant properly. They took the whipping chains and rattled them in their trunks as they sidled up to Motiguj, meaning to hustle him between them. Motiguj had never in the all his life of thirty-nine years, been whipped, and he did not intend to begin a new experience. So he waited, waving his head from right to left, measuring the precise spot in Kalanag's fat side where a blunt tusk could sink the deepest. Kalanag had no tusks. The chain was the badge of his authority, but for all that he swung wide of Moti Guj at the last minute and tried to appear as if he had brought the chain out for amusement. Nazim turned round and went home early. He did not feel fighting fit that morning, so Moti Guj was left standing alone with his ears cocked. That decided the planter to argue no more and Motigudz rolled back to his amateur inspection of the clearing. An elephant who will not work and is not tied up is about as manageable as an 81-ton goose gun loose in a heavy seaway. He slapped old friends on the back and asked them if the, tr if the stumps were coming away easily. He talked nonsense concerning labor and the inalienable rights of elephants to a long nooning and wandered to and fro he thoroughly demoralized the garden till sundown when he returned to his picket for food if you won't work you shan't eat said chihun angrily you're a wild elephant and no educated animal at all go back to your little jungle your jungle chihun's little brown baby was rolling on the floor of the hut and stretching out his fat arms to the huge shadow in the doorway Motiguj knew well that it was the dearest thing on earth to Chihun. He swung out his trunk with a fascinating crook at the end, and the brown baby threw itself, shouting upon it. Motiguj made fast and pulled up till the brown baby was crowing in the air twelve feet above his father's head. Great Lord, said Chihun, Flower cakes of the best twelve in number, two feet across and soaked in rum shall be yours upon the instant, and two hundred pounds weight of fresh cut young sugar cane therewith, deign only to put down safely that insignificant brat who is my heart and my life to me. Monty Goods tucked the brown baby comfortably between his four feet that could have knocked into toothpicks all of Chihun's hut and waited for his food. He ate it, and the brown baby crawled away. Motiguj dozed and thought of Tisa, uh, one of many mysteries connected with the elephant is that his huge body needs less sleep than anything else that lives. Four or five hours in the night suffice, just two before midnight, lying down on one side, two just after one o'clock, lying down on the other. The rest of the silent hours are filled with eating and fidgeting and long grumbling soliloquies. At midnight, therefore, Montiguj strode out of his pickets for a thought had come to him that Disa might be lying drunk somewhere in the dark forest with none to look after him. So all that night he chased through the undergrowth, blowing and trumpeting and shaking his ears. He went down the river and blared across the shelves where Disa used to wash him, but there was no answer. He could not find Disa, but he disturbed all the other elephants in the lines and nearly frightened to death some gypsies in the woods. At dawn, Disa returned to the plantation. He had been very drunk indeed, and he expected to get in trouble for outstaying his leave. He drew a long breath when he saw that the bungalow and the plantation were still uninjured, for he knew something of Mutiguj's temper 
and reported himself with many lies and salams. Motiguj had gone to his pickets for breakfast. The night exercise had made him hungry. Call up your, ble your beast, said the planter. And Disa shouted in the mysterious elephant language that some hoots believe came from China at the birth of the world, when elephants and not men were masters. Motiguj heard and came. Elephants do not gallop. They move from places at varying rates of speed. If an elephant wishes to catch an express train, he would not gallop, but he could catch the train. So Motiguj was at the planter's door almost before Chihun noticed that he had left his pickets. He fell into Deesa's arms, trumpeting with joy, and the man and the beast wept and slobbered over each other and huddled each other from head to heel to see that no harm had befallen. Now we will get to work, said Deesa. Lift me up, my son, and my joy. Motiguj swung him up, and the two went to the coffee clearing to look for difficult stumps. The planter was too astonished to be very angry.